Welcome to the Jongit Games tutorial and playthrough for Hybris. In this video, I'll be teaching you how to play the game as we go through the first full round, and if you'd like to watch the rest of the game, you can do so by clicking the link to the extended playthrough that is down below in the description, or you can click the I up there in the top corner. Before we move on, I would like to ask that you please turn on the Klingon subtitles. That way, if I make any mistakes while I play, I can then put corrections on the screen where you should be able to see them. The next thing I'd like to ask is that if you end up enjoying this video, that you please click the like button for it down below, as well as the subscribe button for the channel. Also, if you would like to directly support this channel and the creation of future videos like this one, then please go to jongitsgames.com support. There you'll find a bunch of ways that you can really help things out, and some of them come with cool bonuses like voting on a couple of the videos that I film each month. Alright, let's jump into the game. Out here, the game is fully set up and ready to play for our three different players. Now, I do want to mention that this is a prototype version of the game, so the art and components are not necessarily what you'll find in the final version. Well, let's start things off with a brief overview of how this game plays. Now, each player is an Olympian god, and as we go through the game, we are going to visit a variety of action spots in the middle of the table, and we will also send out our warriors and our prophets to activate those spots as well. Now, what we are trying to do is become stronger as a god, and we will do that by activating these spots and also developing technologies which we can put out here into the mortal world. Now, down here, we can fight each other for activating different spots on the map, and we can also fight against neutral challenges as well as complete sagas down here. Now, it's worth noting that each god has asymmetric effects specific to them, and as they play through the game, each god will be able to unlock various enhancements to increase the number of asymmetric effects that they have. Now, we are going to be playing this game until we go through six overall rounds, and once that happens, we can count up our points, or if at any moment any player has unlocked all six of their enhancements, then the game ends immediately with that player being the winner. Now, obviously, there is a lot more going on in this game than what I have said so far, and I will explain each of these details as we run into them. Now, at this point, I think we should start playing the game, and today we are going to be playing as Zeus, which is the yellow player. Now, we can start the first round of the game off with the Divine Pillar phase. The way this works is each player will take one Divine Pillar card from the pool in the middle of the table, and we will take them in the order of our greatness. Now, this is the greatness track, and we will go from the left to the right. And as you can see, we start the game all the way on the left, which means we get to choose a pillar first. So let's focus on these cards, and you'll notice that all six of them have their own specific custom effect. Now, I will explain how these work once we bump into them in the game, but in general, any text on the top is something that you gain when you play your god figure out, and any text on the bottom is something that happens to all of your opponents when you do the top action. Now, I'm sure you've noticed that there is a number in the middle of each of these cards ranging from 1 up to 6. Now, this is going to be our relative turn order in the middle of the round. That means if we took the 1, then we would be the first player to actually play out actions in the round, and if we took this 6, then we would be guaranteed to go last. Now, I think we actually do want this 6, so we are going to go last, and then after that, the green Athena player can choose one of these pillars here. Although before that happens, let's come up here to our player area where we can put the pillar indoctrination right up here so that we can easily see the effects of our card as well as our relative turn order. So green can pick and they have decided they want the pillar guidance. So that will head right over here. And lastly, the purple Hades player can choose from these four options. Now, if they took the four or the five, then that means they would go second because, of course, the three would be the lowest number. But if they took the one or the two, then that means they would go first. After considering these options, they are going to go with the five, which is called symbolism. They can place that right over here. Once each player has chosen a pillar card, we will then place a prayer token down onto each of the remaining pillar cards that does not already have a prayer token on it. In this case, we can place these down onto all three of them, and in the future, if a player takes one of these uh, Divine Pillar cards, they will also get the prayer resource. And once again, in the future round, if there is already one of these on there, you do not add a second. Alright, it's now time for the second phase of the round, which is the planning phase. The way this works is each player will simultaneously look at their stack of available location discs, and they will put one of these underneath each one of their warriors and their prophets. Now, each player starts the game with one warrior and one prophet, as well as this standee right here of their god, which is actually ourselves going around to activate things. Now, these locations are going to dictate where each of the warriors and prophets will activate later on in the round, but you'll notice I did not say you put one underneath your god, because you can figure out where your god will go the moment you play them, instead of having to plan that now. 
So we have our eight location discs here, and I think for this first round, let's place this one, which says the Olympus, over here by our Prophet, and then we will place this one, which says the Moiras, over here with our Warrior. Now there are eight of these location discs and seven locations in the middle of the table, so that means there is a duplicate for the mortal world where there are two of those in this stack. Now we do want to put these face down so that our opponents can't see what we are doing with our standees, but for the purposes of this video I think I will leave them face up so that we can see what we are going to be doing and we can just pretend that our opponents can't see what these say. All right, it looks like we have all finished our planning, which means we can now move into the third phase of the round, which is the action phase. Now, once again, for this, we are going to look at the numbers in the middle of the pillar cards, and the player with the lowest value gets to go first. In this case, that is going to be the green Athena player with their three, so now they can play out either their prophet, their warrior, or their god onto an action space. After considering their options, Green has decided to start with their Prophet, and it looks like they want to send them to the Mortal World. Now, whenever you send out a Prophet or a Warrior, you have to spend one of your Aegeus, and that is a resource that we all start with three of at the start of the game. Now, this is effectively a primordial resource that originates from the Titans that came before us. So Green can spend the Aegeus in order to play the Prophet, and then this Location Token will go down over here. Now this is where they put their used location tokens, and we will talk about this later on in the tutorial, and now the Prophet can visit the mortal world. And that is this map in the middle of the table. As you can see, it is made up of five different cities, and each one of the cities has a single action circle on it. Now in general, when you place a figure out onto any of the boards in the game, you have to put it down onto an empty circle, however, that's not exactly the case for the mortal world. Now, if, for example, this uh, purple warrior was here in Athens and the green player wanted to activate this spot, they could do that as long as they came in with a warrior or their god. So they could come in with Athena, for instance, and head over here. And in order to actually perform this action, they have to actually fight the purple player first and win that combat. And I'll explain how combat works later on. Now, these prophets can't fight, so they can never go down onto an occupied spot in the mortal world. Now that Green has picked their action, the next thing they have to do is perform the bonus on that spot. As you can see, this is a generate one prayer icon. That means we can take a prayer from the supply and we will place that over here in the well of prayers. You can see that icon matches up, so we can place this right over here. And there are ways for players to harvest the prayers of the people from this well, and I'll explain those later. So that's finished up this bonus, and now the green player can choose to do one of the two mortal world actions. Those options are influencing and deploying technologies. So let's focus over here, and it looks like the green player wants to do an influence action. Now what this means is they are going to gain greatness associated with the city they picked, and then they can choose one of the two other bonuses on that city. In this case, we can see that Argos will give Athena two goodness. Now this is shown with the track on the right hand side of each player's board, so they can move their token up twice to show the gain of two goodness. Now I imagine you are curious what this track does, and I'll explain that in more detail later on when we are discussing deploying technologies. After taking their goodness, the next thing they can do is take one of these two bonuses. Now this says they can take three believers from the supply and put it onto their board, and this one says that they can do a take blueprint action that exists over here on the Olympus. Now, in this case, they just want to take the Believers, and they can place those right over here on their board. Now, Believers are a resource that players can use when they are developing technologies, and I'll explain the details of that later on. Well, Athena is done with her turn, so now we can move on to Hades, who has the number 5 on their pillar card. Now, they've decided to send their Prophet over to the Olympus. Now, this is, of course, going to cost them 1 Aegeus, and then they can put this location over there. Once they arrive at the Olympus, there are three different circle action spots to choose from. Now, if all three of these were occupied, then they would instead put their figure up here, and they would suffer the indicated penalty. In this case, they would lose one victory point. Fortunately for them, there are three options available to them, though, and they are going to head over here. Now, after they place this down, they immediately get this bonus, and that gives them one Aegeus resource. So they can add this into their player area. At this point, Hades can do a main action for the Olympus, and there are two different options. 
Now they can take a blueprint or they could convert prayer energy. And the way this second one works is they can spend prayer resources from their area in order to get the associated benefit on the right hand side. Now, at the moment, Hades does not have any prayer, but if they did have some, we could see over here, they could spend two prayer to gain a victory point. They could also spend two prayer in order to go up once on the greatness track. If you remember from before, that track is down here, and this tells you the order in which the gods will be drafting pillar cards at the start of future rounds. Now, whenever you gain greatness, you simply swap your position with the person to your left like that, and if you are already over on the leftmost spot, you simply gain a victory point. Instead, if you were to lose greatness and you were on the right-hand side, you would then lose one victory point. Coming back to the conversion chart, you can see the next option costs three prayer and lets you unlock a spark. Then there is a four prayer cost to unlock a temple. And finally, four prayer to unlock a prophet or a warrior. Now, all three of these rewards are somewhat similar because these are the different types of things that exist on top of the enhancements in our player areas. Now, as soon as every one of the tokens on top of an enhancement is removed, then that enhancement will become unlocked. And as you can see, this one up here just has a single cube, which is the spark. So removing that would just cost three prayer. Unfortunately for Hades, they currently don't have any prayer, but this is one of the main ways you can remove these items to unlock the enhancements. Now, over here, you can see this is a temple, and whenever you remove these items, you have to go from the left over to the right. Lastly, you can see that there are warrior options and profit options on here, and when these are removed, you can put them into your reserve to then potentially use in future rounds. Once again, Hades cannot unlock any of these, though, because they don't have any prayer at the moment. This means at the Olympus, Hades is going to do the take a blueprint action. Now, this says that they can look through all of these five different stacks of technologies and choose the one that they would like to work on. Now, there are obviously a bunch of options, and the easiest way to figure out what you want is by looking through this technology's booklet, which lists out every single one of them, and it shows the front and back of each technology. Now, on the front, it shows the cost of the technology, and the back shows the benefit. And in this case, they would like to take this Aegeus turbine right here. Next up, they can place their chosen technology into the workshop, which is part of the forge. Now, you always place this onto the leftmost spot, and if there is already a technology there, you simply shift all of the other ones over in the workshop. Now, once it is in the workshop, it can be built by paying the resource costs listed on there, and those costs will lower as these are pushed through the workshop. In this case, the Aegeus Turbine costs one Believer and four Aegeus, but again, these discounts can apply to either of those costs. And if a technology is all the way over here and it gets bumped out, then it is immediately pushed into the factory without paying any costs. The final thing Hades has to do is place one of their tokens on top of this technology to show that they are the ones who put this down into the workshop. This means it's time for us to go, and I think let's start by placing our god Zeus. Now, whenever you place your god out, you don't have to pay any Aegeus, and you can place it down onto any spot of the board because, of course, you do not have to use planning tokens with your god. And I think let's head over to the Oracle. As you can see, there are three different action spots on this area, and if all three of these are full, then we would instead head down here and lose one Believer. Fortunately, that is not the case for us, so we can choose any of these bonuses. Now, this would give us one Believer. That one will let us take a single prayer from the prayer well and add it into our supply. And this one lets us increase our goodness track once. Now, I think let's go ahead and take one prayer. So we can grab this from the well. And at the moment, it was the only one in that spot. And we already know that we want to spend these prayers to convert them into various bonuses at the Olympus later on in the game. So we can add this up into the prayer spot of our board. Next up, we can take a main action at the Oracle, and there are two different options to choose from. The first one says Omen, and the way this works is we would have to select a conflict card from our hand and place it face up down here, but we would only be able to do that if we would be adding in a new element. Now, these conflict cards have several things going on them, but for now, I just want to draw your attention to the top here, where you can see these two element symbols here and those two over there. Now, if it's colored in, then that means that conflict card has that element. So, for instance, we could do this by placing this card over here, and then we put this Zeus token down to show we put that down. Now, in the future, if anyone else wants to do the Omen action, they would have to place a conflict card that adds in a new element. So, in that case, that would be Fire or Air. So, for example, Hades could come over here and play this card, which has Fire and Mountain, 
the fact that these double up is fine because that did add in a new element. This means if there are conflict cards down here showing all four elements, then the omen action cannot be performed anymore. Now, when you do this action, you also have to get rid of one believer back to the supply, and then you can peek at the bottom of the upcoming primordial. As you can see, these are the three primordials we will be interacting with this game. And as part of setup, we randomly chose one for each of these three different types. Now, we will reveal these at the end of the second, fourth, and sixth rounds of the game. And if you do the omen to peek at it, then you will not suffer the main consequences of that primordial. Uh, each one of these has an effect, and we won't know what it is until it is flipped over. So peeking at it with the omen is certainly going to help things out, although many primordials still have an effect that hit everyone, even somebody who played a card down over here. Now, as I said, this will cost a believer, and at the moment, we don't have any believers, so this is not an action that we can even do. That means instead, we are going to do the premonition action, and this simply lets us draw the top premonition card, and then we can gain a single victory point. So we can take that one victory point, pushing us over there, and then we can add this premonition card over to our player area. As you can see, we started the game with one of these, and these are cards that we want to keep hidden from our opponents, but we are allowed to look at them. Now these are effectively bonus goals that we are trying to work towards as we play. As you can see, the premonition we started with was called Conquest, and that says you can play this card whenever you win a fight. Now when you do that, you gain the reward at the bottom, so that one will give us three victory points, and because of this, I am planning on trying to win a fight later on this round. Now the new one we got says Olympic Games, and it says you have to be at the Olympus, and you have to be first on the Greatness track. Well, currently we are first on the Greatness track, so I think we should probably try to go to the Olympus on our next turn, because that would let us spend this Premonition, and that would let us unlock a Spark from one of our enhancements. Alright, we are now done with our main action, and it's now time for us to play our Divine Pillar card that we drew earlier in the round. Now, you always play this on the turn where you use your god figure, and you can play the Divine Pillar either before you take your bonus, after that, before you take your main action, or just after that. So obviously we have just finished our main action, so this is our last opportunity to use Indoctrination. Now as an action, it says we can earn a warrior or a prophet from one of our enhancements, and then we gain a bonus location token. So let's look back to our player board, and as I mentioned before, whenever you remove any of these items, you have to go from the left to the right. That means the only option available for us is removing this profit here because they are all the way to the left. Because as you can see, both of these warriors have two items in front of them and this profit has a single spark in front of them. So that means we can indoctrinate this profit and they are now unlocked from that enhancement and we can add them over here into our reserve. Now we won't be able to use this profit until the next round, but that is an entire another action we can take, of course, as long as we can pay a GS for them. This also means that we are one spark cube away from unlocking the Dodona site enhancement. Next up, we can take a bonus location disc, and we can add that to all of our other locations, and whenever you assign one of these to any of your warriors or prophets, they can then go to any location of your choice, and then that bonus disc will be returned to the supply. Lastly, the bottom part of this cart says all other players will now gain one goodness, and they will add one prayer into the well. Obviously, both of our opponents are pretty happy to gain that goodness. And then in player order, they can add prayers to the well. So green will add this right over here, and then purple will add that. And the reason this matters is because at the well, if you have added the ninth or more prayer to it, you immediately lose a believer. And if there are ever 14 or more prayers in the well once you add one, you actually empty out the well entirely, and then one temple will be destroyed from the mortal world. Now, the player whose temple will be destroyed is the one who is highest up on the Greatness track. Well, we are done with all of our Divine Pillar actions, so we can simply place this face down in our area, and that's finished up our turn. All right, it's now time for the Athena player to take their second action of the round, and they've decided to send out their warrior Bellerophon to the Colosseum. Now, that is going to cost them one Aegeus, because that always costs an Aegeus whenever you deploy a non-god figure. So they will head over here, and as you can see, the Colosseum has three different action spots on it. Now, if all three of these were filled in, then the player would lose one Aegeus, and it's worth noting that this symbol means you can never send a prophet over to the Colosseum, so it has to be a warrior or a god figure. Now, we can see these bonuses are going to be drawing the top conflict card from that player's conflict deck, 
This one gains one Aegeus, and finally this will give that player one victory point. In this case, they've decided to go here, and that will give them one Aegeus. Next up, green can do a main action at the Colosseum, where they can either train or fight a hero. Now, when you fight a hero, you choose one of the heroes that is still available, and you then fight them according to their card over here. And I know I haven't described fights just yet, and I'll go into those details soon. Now, if you win the fight, then you gain that hero figurine as well as the card, and each one of these hero figures has a special ability that is listed on the card, and the player who wins that fight will have that hero for the rest of the game. In this case, green decides they do not want to get into a fight just yet, so instead they are going to train. The way this works is they simply draw the top card from this Colosseum deck, and these are all trained conflict cards. This will then be added into the green player's hand of cards, and they started the game with one of the regular conflict cards, and they will now have this card for the rest of the game. At this point, the Hades player can go, and they are going to use their Hades figurine in order to visit the mortal world. In this case, they are going to go over here to Athens, and that is going to add three prayers into the prayer well. After that, they are now going to play their Divine Pillar card before they do their main action. Now this says Symbolism, and they can place a temple into a city where they don't already have one. When they come back to their player area, they have two temples on the leftmost side of an enhancement, so they are going to choose this temple right here, and that means they have a Spark and one Warrior to unlock in order to unlock their Orpheus enhancement. So they're going to put this temple down here in Athens, and a player is never allowed to have more than one of their temples within one given city. After that, each other player will gain one premonition, so we will get this one, which says Expanded Fort, and it says be in Lemnos and have built a pillar-type technology in Lemnos. That's got a really great benefit of one production in the factory and one spark. After that, the green player will get this premonition. Next up, Hades can do a Mortal World action, and they are going to influence. This means they are going to gain two goodness, and then they can take two believers, or they could go up once on the greatness track. Now, in addition to these benefits, because they have a temple in this city, they now unlock these benefits here. That means they can gain plus one goodness, so they would get three goodness total, or they could gain one believer, no matter which of the other influence options they take. So, three goodness will bring them to the top of their track, and if they gain any more while this is up here, they won't get any benefits for that. Now, at this point, I'd like to draw your attention to the Hades effect, Bad Omen Prophet. Now, this is an asymmetric effect that is actually a negative for Hades. It says that during an influence action, you reduce by one the number of believers that you just earned. Now, they were either going to earn two believers or one greatness, and because of this detraction, they've decided to go with the greatness. Now, their temple does still give them one believer no matter what they chose, so they can add this onto their board. And then over here, they can swap their places with green, which puts them up once on the greatness track. All right, it's now our turn, and I think let's head to Olympus with our prophet. Now, that is going to cost us one Aegeus. And then when we arrive, I think let's take this bonus, which will give us one greatness. As you can see, we are already at the front of the track, so that is simply going to give us one more victory point. Next up, let's play the Premonition card that we got on our last turn. That says Olympic Games, and we have to be at Olympus, which we currently are, and we have to be first on the Greatness track. So that means as a benefit, we are going to gain one Spark, and then we can discard this to the Oracle. So we can look back to our board, and I think we should certainly pull this Spark off, and then whenever you gain a Spark, you put it down into an empty slot on this track at the bottom. And in this case, I think let's go right over here, because that will give us one determination. Now we can track that right over here, and we can slide that up to the three spot, and the determination value that we have dictates how many cards we can play in combat, and we are planning on fighting before this round is over. Next up, we can see that the Dodonna Site Enhancement has no more items on it. That means we have unlocked this, so we can pick it up and immediately gain the victory points listed at the top. So that will be one victory point for us, which will bring us up to three. And then you can see revealed on the board as well as on the back of this enhancement, we have a new ability. And it says here, at the beginning of the end of the age phase, if you're the first on the greatness track, you gain two victory points. Well, we are currently the first on that track, so hopefully that stays that way. And obviously getting extra points for being great seems like a good plan for us. So we will keep this in mind as the game goes on and try to continue to prioritize being first on that greatness track. 
Now, as I mentioned at the start of the tutorial, if a player is ever able to unlock all six of their enhancements, then the game ends immediately with that player winning, and we don't even look to the victory point scores. So obviously, we should try to push towards that while also still getting points. At this point, we can now take our main action at the Olympus, and I think we should take a blueprint. Now, I figure let's take this illuminated stoa from the architecture stack, because we now have this premonition card, which will give us some really nice bonuses if we build an architecture type in Lemnos. So I think that is going to be the plan. Next up, we can slide this into the workshop. And now I'd like to talk more about how the forge works. It's possible we won't see any player activate this in this first round, so let's talk about its functions. Now, as you can see, there's just one action space over here for figurines, and it has a dotted line around the outside, which means any number of players can activate this within a round without suffering a penalty. Now, the bonus for this action spot shows gears, which matches up with the produce action, which is one of the two main actions for the forge. That means this bonus is effectively doing produce, and then after that you can choose one of these two, which could be producing again. Now let's talk about how these two actions work, starting with build. Now this says that you choose one technology from the workshop, and you move it into the first slot of the factory. In order to do that, you have to spend the associated costs on the back. So for the illuminated stoa, we have to spend three believers and two Aegeus. Now there are discounts which show up later on in the workshop. For instance, right now, the Hades player can build the Aegeus Turbine for minus one resource, which could be the Believer, or it could be the Aegeus. When moving a technology up here, if there is already a tile in the first slot, you slide the rest of them down, and then put that technology over there. So that is how we bring technologies from the workshop over to the factory. Now, the other action over here says Produce, and this simply slides all of the tiles in the factory one space over to the right. Now, if a tile falls out the other side, then it gets put into that player's reserve, and if by sliding these tiles you push a tile that does not belong to you out, then you gain one victory point for helping out that other opponent. And this can happen with a produce action, as well as any other effect that will cause a slide on this track. Once the tile emerges from the factory, we can put it down onto an empty holding spot on our board, and if both of these are full, we have to discard a previous tile. Once there, the tiles will wait until we can deploy them into the mortal world, and I'll describe the details of how that works later on in the tutorial. Alright, it's time for the green player to take their last figure action of the round, and this is their god Athena, so they don't have to spend any Aegeus. In this case, they've decided to head over to the underworld. As you can see, there are three different action spots on this location, and if all three are full, then they could go over here, which has a penalty of losing one Aegeus. In this case, all three are empty though, so they could go here to get a victory point, here to gain one goodness, or here to draw the top conflict card from their personal deck. After considering these options, they want to take a goodness, which will bring them to the top of that track. After that, they can perform a main action at the Underworld, and those options are Drain or Resurrect. Now, Resurrect lets you bring back to life any fallen warriors who are currently in the Underworld, and your warriors go into the Underworld every time they lose in battle. Once they are here, they cannot be used until they are resurrected, and there is no additional cost to Resurrect besides, of course, using the action for this. Now, obviously, the green player has not lost any warriors yet, so instead, they are going to drain. Now, this lets them take an amount of Aegeus equal to this value in the middle of the current primordial that is over in the underworld, effectively a draining that primordial energy from them. So in this case, they are going to drain three Aegeus, which they can then add onto their player board. At this point, it's time for them to use their divine pillar because they did use their god this round, and this says Guidance. Now, the effect here says they can take a technology of their choice and put it into the first space of the factory if you can pay the cost. In this case, they would like to bring out commercial transactions, and I do want to point out that this is a social type of technology, and Athena has a special effect that's called Peace Goddess, and it says that every time a social technology is deployed, Athena will gain two points. Now that happens even when an opponent deploys a social type of technology. So we're not too surprised to see they do want that type of technology here, and that is going to cost them three believers as well as one Aegeus. So they can now put one of their tokens on top of it and put it into the first slot of the factory. As we just talked about, that's going to be right up here, and that means this Divine Pillar has effectively saved them taking a blueprint action as well as a build action. Next up, it says that all other players will gain a single trained conflict card from the Colosseum. 
So we can take this top card called Blast, and in general, these trained conflict cards are more powerful than the ones we have in our starting deck of 18 cards. Next up, Hades also draws one of those. Before we move on, I'd now like to bring your attention to our player board. Now for Zeus, it says we have the Persuasion ability, and that says when another player drains with a god or a warrior, we gain one Aegeus. Well, the green player did just drain with their god, so we can take one Aegeus and put that into our supply. And at this point, the Athena player is done with their turn. This means Hades can go, and they have a warrior left, and it appears they planned to have them go to the Moiris. As you can see, that's down here, and this icon means you can never send profits to the Moiris. Now, over here, there are two different options. This option lets them gain a victory point, and any number of players can do that, whereas this option just lets them draw two cards from the top of their conflict deck. In this case, that is what they'd like to do. So they will draw those from the top of this deck, and there is no hand limit for the conflict cards that you currently have in your hand. Next up, they can complete a quest. As you can see down here, there are three available quest cards, and there are two different types. The first type have blue uh, backgrounds here, which are sagas, and the other type have red, which are challenges. Now, the purple player decides they would like to go on this saga, and that is the quest Slaying of the Stamphalian Birds. So they can focus in on the saga, and they are going to go down to the area of this card that is unrevealed and has the lowest number. In this case, this saga has a 1 and a 2, so they start here at the 1. Now this says they have to own a temple in Athens, and that is currently the case. This means they can take the associated reward, which will be 3 believers, which will go into their area, and then they can take a marker of their god and place it over this to show that that part of the saga is complete. Next up, they can continue working on this saga, or they could stop. If they stopped, then in the future, when another figure came to the Moiras, then that figure could continue working on this quest, and they would pick it up where the other player left off. So in this case, that would be this option right over here. Now, in this case, it looks like the Hades player decides they do want to continue with the saga right now, and when you continue on within the same turn, you have to pay this link penalty. You do not have to pay this if somebody comes in later to complete the quest on another turn, but in this case, that says they have to discard one conflict card from their hand. Currently, they have four cards, so they will choose this one to discard to their own personal discard pile, and it's worth noting, if you ever go to draw cards from your conflict deck and don't have any left, then you shuffle up your discard pile to create a new deck. After paying that penalty, they can move on with this saga, and the next spot says they have to discard a card from their hand. So they now have three cards in their hand, and this is the one that they want to discard. This means they will get this reward, which is one victory point, which brings them to one, and then, since this was the last part of the saga, that means this quest card is complete. Now, the player who finishes the saga off will get these benefits, so in this case, that is going to be two more victory points, bringing them up to three, and they can remove a single spark from one of their enhancements. Well, considering one of their enhancements just has one spark on it, they are going to remove this from the Elysian Fields. Now, they have to put this spark down onto one of these slots at the bottom, and they're going to go over here, which will increase their determination by one. Now, they can unlock the Elysian Fields, and this says that whenever a warrior is defeated, the uh, Hades player will earn one prayer from the prayer well. Now, the Hades player definitely wants their opponents to have bad turns, because obviously this gives them benefits when warriors are defeated, but this will also give them a benefit if their own warrior is defeated. If we look down here, Hades has another ability throughout the entire game that says whenever a player loses a fight against another player, Hades will gain two victory points. So once again, they do like it when their opponents fight. Now at the beginning of this turn, I did mention that there is another type of card, which are these challenges, and I'll explain how these work very soon, because this is what we are going to be doing on our next turn. Speaking of that, we can come up here, and we will take the last action of this round, and as you can see, we planned to go to the Moiras. So that means we are going to go there with Achis, who is our warrior. And when we head to this area, you'll notice that the only option we have is this one, which will give us one victory point, which certainly is not bad. After that, we can now complete a quest, and if you remember, we have a premonition that says we gain a bonus if we are able to win a fight, so I think let's go to this challenge where we want to try and kill the Nemean Lion, which does put us into the first combat of the game. Well, the first thing that we have to do is calculate how much force our enemy has that we then have to overcome. 
In this case, we can look down over here, and it says that the Nemean Lion has a base force of one, and then they are going to draw one random conflict card from the Colosseum deck. In this case, that top card is Great Strategist, and this has a force of three. So that means the Nemean Lion is currently at three plus one, or four force. And then on top of that, if there are ever element icons over here, and they match up with elements on the drawn cards, then for each element that is drawn, there will be one more force added. So this means that for every one water element showing, there will be one more force, and there is one of those, so that means the total force is 1 plus 3 plus 1, or 5. Alright, we can now fight, and we have two conflict cards in our hand. Now we are going to win if we get to 5 or more force, because that is the amount of the Nemean Lion. And as you can see with these cards, we have a 2 and a 4. So what we want to do is play one of these cards out, and I figure we'll start with Divine Touch. Now we can put this right over here, and the first thing to note is there is a 1 in the top left corner with a Determination symbol. That means the Divine Touch card will cost 1 Determination, and the amount of Determination that we have to spend is dictated by this track over here. So this means we have 3 Determination to spend total, and fortunately for us, the other card in our hand costs 2. So 2 plus the 1 that we've already played gets us to 3, which means we are legally allowed to play this. If this cost 3, then in that case we would not have enough Determination to put it out. So let's come back over here, and you'll notice that we have added 2 Force into the fight, and we also get 2 Aegeus as a benefit from this card. Well, 2 Force is not the 5 that we need, and I did say that we have 2 more Determination to spend, so let's go ahead and play last. Now, it's worth noting that both of these cards say Divine at the top, and that's important because this Nemean Lion has a global penalty that reduces the force of your weapon cards by 1. So fortunately, we don't have weapons because that would certainly have made this harder. Now, as you can see, this Blast is going to add 4 Force, and it says if the opponent plays a weapon conflict card, then this gains 1 more Force. Now, you are allowed to fight your opponents, and I'll talk about that very soon, but obviously, in this case, that is not going to come into play. This means we now have 4 plus 2, or 6 Force, and that is enough to win this conflict. But before we move on, I'd like to point out these symbols at the bottom part of the card. As you can see, they show up on several card types. And if, after playing a card, you ever make a full symbol, then you will get some bonus force. Now, when you put these cards out, you start at the left and go over. So obviously, when we put this here, that did not make a matching bonus. But for example, this would, and if we had played this out, then that would have cost one of our determination and given us two force plus one for that completed symbol. Now, the same can be said for the weapons. As you can see, that shows weapon at the top, and you can make those completed symbols as well in order to gain bonus force. Obviously, that is not the case here, and we still have enough force to win, which means both of these cards will go into our discard pile, and then we have completed this challenge, so we will get the benefit, which says we will unlock one spark and gain two victory points. So those two points will bring us up to six, and then we can remove one spark. As you can see, our only options are these three over here because the leftmost item over here are temples. Now, with that in mind, we can look to our cheat sheet, which tells us what these enhancements are. This top one is the Lightning Bolt, and when this is unlocked, it says before you fight, you can pay X amount of Aegeus to draw X amount of cards. In addition to that, this will gain us one determination, and it will unlock this special card over here. You'll notice this has been here all game long, and that is indeed the Lightning Bolt, and this will get added into our hand, and it is a pretty powerful card to Determination, giving 4 Force, and it has 3 of those elemental symbols on it. Next up, we could start working on Heracles. Now this says that when Heracles fights, he gains plus 2 Force, and when you win a fight or a confrontation with Heracles, you get 2 Aegeus or 2 more victory points. Now Heracles is this warrior right here, and that is the final thing that you have to remove in order to unlock the effects, so that will give us another uh, figure to use, and obviously that figure is very good at fighting. The last option that we can work towards right now is the Scepter. This says at the beginning of the end of age phase, you can move one token from your used area back into your reserve so that you can use it again on your next turn. I know this icon shows the unavailable one, but that should indicate this spot right up here. In addition to that, we would also gain one bonus token. Out of all of these options, I think working towards unlocking Heracles feels the best, so we can pull this spark off, and then I figure, why not go down onto this spot here in order to go up once on our goodness track. Next up, we can look to our premonition cards, and our conquest card can be revealed. 
It says, play this card when you win a fight, which just happened, so we can discard this and gain three victory points. So we'll go up to nine. And at this point, we have completed the quest. Now I'd like to talk about what would have happened if we had been defeated instead of won. In this case, with a warrior, we would simply cast this warrior down into the underworld, where we would not be able to use them until we did an underworld resurrect action. Now instead, if we had been defeated while fighting with our god, then that god would become wounded, which means we'd bring it back to our area and put it laying down on the table to show that we cannot use them again this round. In addition to that, we would be shamed by this action and lose one greatness point. And finally, if we had not used our Divine Pillar card yet, then Stagnation would set in, and we would have to give all of our opponents the bonus from the bottom, but we would not even get the bonus from the top. So definitely try to use these top actions before going into combat with a god. At this point, our turn is done, but before we move on, I'd like to talk about combat a little more. I mentioned earlier that when you go to the Colosseum, you can fight a hero, and when you do that, you simply select one of these cards here and fight them in the exact same way that we just did the challenge down in the Moiris. Next up, I'd like to discuss combat with opponents in the mortal world. Now, this happens whenever you enter a city with a god or a warrior that already has a figure in it. For instance, if we came over here to Argos with our god and there is this prophet. Now, if in a combat there is ever a prophet, then the combat immediately ends and the prophet runs back to that player's area where they put it face down to not be used again. And then the player who tried to enter that spot can take their reward of simply doing the action in that city. Instead, if you decide to go onto a spot that has a god or a warrior on it, then combat will ensue. The way this works is very similar to when we fought that Nemean lion, but instead of fighting against the game, we are going against each other's conflict cards. So in this case, the attacking player will play one card, and then the defending player will play a card, and when you put a card out, each player will take one of these tokens, and they will, in hiding, select which side they want to go face up. Now this shows if they want to continue on with that part of the fight, or if they want to stop and not put any more cards in. Now, if one player stops, then they won't add more cards, but the other player can continue putting as many cards down as they want to, and once both players have stopped playing the conflict cards, the player with the highest amount of force will win, and if there is a tie, then the defender will win the tie. After that happens, the winner will get to do the action of that city, and the loser will have the standard defeat effects happen to them. If it's a god, then they are shamed, and this will go back into the wounded area, and if instead it's a warrior, then they will go to the underworld. Well, the action part of the round is over, but before we move on, I would like to talk about deploying technologies into the mortal world. The way this works is you can select one technology from a holding spot on your player board, and you will put it down into an available spot in the city you just activated. For example, let's say the green player went over here into Lemnos, and they already had their commercial transactions on their board. In this case, they could then deploy this into one of these empty spots. For instance, they might put it right over here. Once that is placed, each of their opponents in turn order can decide if they want to challenge this technology deployment. If an opponent does that, they have to have a warrior or a god currently not used, and they will then bring that warrior or god over here into this area. Now, if it is a prophet that is deploying the technology, then a fight happens where the prophet immediately leaves, and at that point, the technology will still be constructed, but the challenging player will get a bonus. Now, if this wasn't a prophet, but instead it was a warrior, then a battle would happen between this warrior and the god or warrior coming into challenge, and that plays out just like regular conflict between players. If in this combat the challenging player loses, then they suffer the standard defeat consequences, but if they win, then they will get some bonuses, which I will talk about shortly. Now let's just say that there was no challenge, and Ulysses over here was developing this technology. This means the next thing they would do is gain the benefits down here at the bottom of the technology. So this one would give them two victory points, and they could then take up to three prayer from the prayer well. If there is not enough prayer in the well, then they would take up to that amount. Moving on, they would then get one victory point for every technology that is connected to the new technology with these link points. You may have noticed these icons on the outside, and you may have also noticed these paths that connect the different cities. So if, for instance, this was down over here, then this path shows that these are effectively connected sides. So by placing this right over here, they would get one victory point for this connected technology. Now let's just say that Hades had this technology down here, and the connected technology will also give a point to that controlling player, so in this instance, Hades would also get a victory point for making that link. 
Now, obviously, these links can also hook up to other technologies within that given city, but by placing this right over here, this technology would never link up to either of these two options. After that, the player will get a bonus victory point if the technology played matches the symbol of that city. As you can see, the social symbol is down here in Argos, whereas Lemnos has an architecture symbol. In addition to the benefits I've already discussed, you also get every single bonus that is listed on the goodness track at or below where your token is. So in this case, the green player has maxed out their track, so that means they will unlock one spark. They will also draw a conflict card from the deck. This right here will give them one victory point for every linked technology to the new one they placed, but their opponents do not gain any victory points from that. This right here will give them one point, and lastly, they will also gain one greatness point. After they've taken all of these benefits, their goodness track will reset back down to the bottom. Finally, if a player has a temple in the city where they deployed, they can gain a bonus victory point, or they can take one more prayer from the well. The final thing to say about scoring technologies is what happens if an opponent successfully challenges the deployment. Now, in that case, they can steal one of the rewards. The first of these is they could take the victory points that that technology says. The second option is they could take the prayer that that technology gives. And the third option is the successfully challenging player can steal all of the benefits from the goodness track of the player who just deployed that technology. All right, let's keep moving on with the round. And since everybody has played all of their actions, we can move into the end of round phase. The first thing that we have to do here is collect all of the divine pillars, and we will put them back into the main supply where they can be picked in the next round. After that, each player can simultaneously pull back all of their figurines that are, of course, not currently at the Underworld Gate. Next up, we can activate the Dodonna Site enhancement that we unlocked. That says at the beginning of the end of age phase, if you're the first player on the Greatness Track, you gain two points. As you can see, that is the case, so we get two more points, which brings us up to 11. Moving on, we can now take any tokens in this unavailable location spot and bring them off of our board into our reserve, and then after that we move any used locations into the unavailable spot. This means we obviously won't be able to use these tokens in the next round, but at the end of the next round, these will once again be available for us. Next up, we have to advance the quests. The way this works is we are going to discard the rightmost quest, even if it is a saga with tokens on it, and then we will shift the rest of the cards over and reveal new ones until we have three face up. In this case, we don't actually have any face-up, so we can flip over three. This is the struggle against Antius. Then there is capture of the Serenian Hind. And finally, there is a saga. This is the Sphinx Enigma that has four different steps to it. After that, the forge will burn, which means a neutral produce action will happen. So every single technology will slide down, and if any had fallen off the end, then that would go into that player's reserve area. So it would have been nice to get uh, one of these up here for that free produce action, but it looks like only the green player was able to take advantage of that in this first round. Next up, it's time for the fear step, where we check the track and see if there is a primordial symbol underneath the token. Obviously, that is not the case, but at the end of the second round, that will be the case. So for this example, we would then reveal this card right here and then suffer those effects. Now, for example, we could see a card that is not in the game, and this one it says Pontus. Now, it has a Wrath effect, and this will hit every single player that did not do an Omen before that Primordial was revealed. In this case, it says each concerned player has to fight against Pontus, and it has the specifics of the fight listed right down there. Now, after that, many of these also have a global effect that hit every single player, and then once we finish that, this Primordial will be placed into the Underworld, where they could potentially change the Drain amount, although in this example, it would go from 3 to 3. Finally, any conflict cards played for the Omen would be put back into each player's discard pile. After the Fear Step, the final thing that we have to do is advance the round marker one space forward. And if this was over here and try to advance off the track, then that means we had just finished the sixth round of the game. So at that point, we would then go into final scoring. The way this works is each player can score bonus points for their completed culture technologies. Now, if you look at this booklet right here, we can see there are six of these, and in the middle of each, it shows a full hourglass. Now, in the middle of each technology, it tells us when those technologies will be used. So on the back, we can see the full hourglass is end game scoring, and all of these are conditional, like this one right here, which gives six points to the player who has the most warriors. Now, the non-culture technologies can be activated at different times. For instance, this infinity can be used whenever. The triangle is a reaction to happen in certain circumstances, and then others like this is a immediate one-shot bonus. 
Now, there are other ones that let you get a bonus at the start of your turn or at the end of your turn, and all of these details are explained at the back of the booklet. Once everyone has added up those endgame points, the player with the most points will be the winner. And remember, if at any point any player completes all six of their enhancements, then the game ends immediately even if we haven't completed six rounds, and that player will be the winner even if they had the least amount of victory points at that moment. Well, at this point, I have now covered most of the rules to the game, which means this tutorial is coming to a close. If you'd like to watch the rest of the playthrough all the way to the end, then you can do so by clicking the link to the extended playthrough down below in the description, or you can click the I in the top corner, and I hope you've enjoyed learning how to play Hybris. As always, I'd like to thank everyone who's been supporting this channel, including all of these producer-level Patreon backers. If you too would like to directly support the channel and the creation of videos like this one, then please go to johngetsgames.com support to see a variety of ways with which you can do that. Also, if you enjoyed this video, please click the like button down below as well as the subscribe button for the channel. Thanks for watching.